afternoon. My name is Albert Yoon, and I'm a law professor here at the University of Toronto. This webinar is hosted by the Faculty of Law and the University of Toronto, a vibrant intellectual community that is home to a diverse range of ideas and approaches. The faculty stature as one of the very best law schools in the world rests on the excellence and diversity of our faculty, robust clinics and centers, and the caliber of our students. Today's session is hosted by professors Ben Allery and alumnus Dan DeVoe, who teach uh, Looking Ahead, the Blurred Lines of Technology, Body and Mind, an interdisciplinary course at the Faculty of Law. It's also one of the most popular classes at the law school. Uh, just a little bit about each of the, um, of the hosts for today. Ben researches and teaches in tax law, judicial decision making, and uh, over the years he's published in numerous, <coughs> excuse me, uh, peer review and um, practitioner journals. Uh, his research has been funded by Shirk, um, as well as uh, the Center, the Canadian Foundation for Innovation and the Ontario Ministry of Research and Innovation. He's a co-author of several editions of the leading textbook, Canadian Income Tax Law, and was awarded the Alan New at QC Prize for Excellence by the graduating class of 2009. Uh, beyond his academic career, <coughs> excuse me, Ben is co-founder and CEO of Blue Jay Legal, an AI-powered predictive tax law software. And he's also affiliated faculty member of the Vector Institute for Artificial Intelligence. Um, a few words about Dan. Dan is currently vice president commercial at Shopify. Uh, he was a former co-founder and chief executive officer at helpful.com, a video messenger platform for, for professionals and the co-founder and former co-chief um, executive officer at Ripple, a social performance management plat platform. Uh, Dan holds a BA from the University of Western Ontario, and he received his JD MBA from the University of Toronto, uh, graduating uh, as gold medalist in his class. He also has, in addition to all these other um, uh, uh, degrees, an LLM from Stanford Law School. Dan currently serves on the board of Loblaws Companies Limited and North Incorporated. He's also a founding partner of the Creative Destruction Lab at the Rotman School of Management, and he's an adjunct professor at the Faculty of Law at the University of Toronto. Welcome, Ben and Dan, and we look forward to your presentation. All right, thanks, Albert. Uh, I'm, I'm really, really thrilled to be doing this uh, event with, with you, uh, Daniel. Uh, Daniel and I have been teaching uh, this class, and there's a story behind this class, so I'm gonna hand it over to Daniel in a second to, to tell you more about um, this class, but maybe I just wanna kick off with what you can expect to get out of uh, this next you know, 45 minutes, 50 minutes we're gonna spend together talking about law and technology and uh, this really interdisciplinary view and approach to, to law that I think is really, really a hallmark of what we do at the law school, but also really, uh, I think, exhibited well uh, in the context of this course. Uh, so Dan's gonna talk about it. Um, what, what you're gonna get out of this session is really a bunch of questions, I think interesting questions and important questions that are really, really central for policymakers, certainly um, academics, certainly, um, but I think, uh, professors um, throughout the university in different scientific disciplines for sure to be thinking about, graduate students to be thinking about, and for all of us to be thinking about uh, more broadly in society. These are really important questions. What do we do about um, the sorts of technological changes that, that we're witnessing um, more broadly? And so I think I think Daniel and I have enough intellectual humility uh, to know that we, we don't have all the answers to, to these deep, important questions. But what we can do is surface these questions and talk about some of the conversations that we've been having uh, in class and maybe uh, you know, hit on some of those uh, topics over the course of the next little while. And so the, the whole idea here is to give you a sense of, of just how intellectually stimulating these things are, but also uh, to underscore the, the policy importance of these things for, for modern life. So maybe what I'll do uh, is, is just kind of start with that and then turn it over to Daniel to, to talk a little bit about the genesis uh, of the course and, and how uh, Dean Iacobucci was able to, to convince Daniel to, to spend some of his time teaching uh, with me uh, at the law school. So Daniel, take it away. Cool. Great. Great to be here, Ben. Great to be with uh, everyone. Um, before I get into that, I should mention, if it wasn't already, that we have a Q&A uh, section open. You can go to the bottom of your screen and just type on Q&A. And we really encourage you to um, 
ask questions, give comments, and we'll try and react to it as we go through it. Um, the way we teach our class is extremely conversational, uh, collaborative, and we often hear from students that's the most interactivity, and that's the way we want it because, as Ben said, there are more questions than answers as you think about the future, and none of us has the answers all by ourselves, so it's good to have a conversation about these things. So uh, Ben said, you know, talk a bit about how this started. So uh, when I graduated from U of T Law School, um, I had spent a summer at a law firm and uh, uh, probably realized I didn't, I wasn't cut out for the practice of law, but, um, but I was quite interested because of work I was doing at the business school in entrepreneurship. And I joined a startup that grew uh, very quickly after I graduated. And after a few years, I, I wanted to go back to school. I went back and did a master's at Stanford. They have this program called Law, Science and Technology. And there was a class that was being experimented with by two interesting folks. Uh, one was Lawrence Lessig, uh, who uh, a well-known uh, sort of um, intellectual property lawyer. And another was a guy named Steve Jurvetson, who was the, the J in DFJ, which is one of the top venture firms. And Steve's notable. Um, he was the guy who found Hotmail at the time, but have subsequently gone on to be the first investor in Tesla and in SpaceX. So he's a person who spends a lot of his time thinking about the future. Lessig was a person who spent a lot of time at the time around copyright and how um, you know, tools like peer-to-peer -peer sharing uh, would allow for a different sort of future. And he was frustrated because of the way, I think he thought the law essentially moved too slowly. And the two of them, when they went for a walk, uh, Jurvetson, who spends all his time thinking about the future and in particular, a particular thesis about the future, which we're about to talk about, um, they were struck by how this type of thinking is not really in law faculties. And so they created a seminar course that invited about half or third of the class to be non-lawyers, scientists, uh, technicians, engineers, um, and that they would have an open conversation, uh, thematically different every day, about a different area of exponential technology. And so that class really changed my life. I came back and you know, founded two other companies, but always stayed interested in this topic. And as you said, when, when Ed uh, called me up, he was my professor, so I have, can't say no. Uh, uh, he said, would you like to teach a class thinking about, you know, entrepreneurial law? And, uh, you know, speaking of humility, I'll, I'll admit on this seminar with hundreds of law alumni, I'm a terrible lawyer and not a lawyer, never called to the bar. And so I was like, Ed, I can't teach that. It would be malpractice. But what if we taught this? Because I think it's really important. And he said, well, I think Ben would be the perfect partner. And we've had this great time teaching this class um, in the age of uh, teaching this class over the past uh, six years. And... Um, I see someone says, I thought this was law and technology native COVID-19. It, it is, we'll get to that. Um, and I think the, the, but the framework we wanted to talk about was this framework that we've been working with over the past few years. So let's start with something that uh, I think is interesting. As this pandemic occurred, you've heard many times from people in the legal profession, policymakers, government people, we could never have predicted this. How could we have known that this would happen? And uh, to the question, um, you know, Ben and I have been talking about, at least in one class of our course for six years, about the potential for global pandemics and how this would take the world by surprise and how this was entirely consistent with the thesis of what we've been talking about for a fair bit of time. Uh, it's, uh, I, I won't pretend that we talked about, you know, a coronavirus emerging from southern China, um, but we spent a fair bit of time talking about the implications of this on the world. And the reason I say this is not to pat ourselves on the back, but to point out that many of the things that people say are unpredictable are predictable. We just choose not to pay attention to them or allocate resources to understanding the implications of them. And so that's the starting point when you think about a world of law and technology in the world of COVID. We start with um, this basic premise that came from this class I took and that we've expanded upon as we've taught this. And the basic premise is that we live in a world that is non-linear anymore. And linearity is how most of us think. You know, things go up, if you remember from math, a little X and, X and Y chart, and you, know, you move up a little bit in the straight line. And that's how most things that we experience as human beings grow in a linear way. The thesis of our course is that we live in a world of accelerating exponentials. That, and that actually these exponential technologies are are self-reinforcing. They're making each other go faster. So what, what is an exponential? 
well, the first class of every class we, we teach, we talk about this concept. Um, it's been around for a while, but it's not intuitive. The, the, the sort of parable that's often told is the parable of the uh, peasant who comes to the king and says, you know, uh, and I'll bet you, um, I'll bet you that uh, they, they get into a bet and the king says, well, let's make a bet. And the, and the peasant says, okay, I'll take, put a piece of rice on this chessboard on day one. And I just want all the rice at the end of the day, as long as you keep doubling. And so the king takes the bet on day two, there's two pieces of rice. Then day three, there's four pieces, eight pieces and so on. And it doesn't look like much is happening. The king thinks he's on the winning side of this bet, but that's not the way exponentials work. Uh, towards the second half of the second week, you start to realize that this doubling results in all the rice in the world, all the rice in the kingdom going to this peasant. Exponentials are not intuitive. That curve is observable in many parts of our life these days, in particular observable around the advent of computing power, if you've heard of Moore's law. And this is something that is um, really gonna have implications, but it's not just Moore's law. It's the fact that we've got everyone in the world connected to the internet, more brains connected. We've got global travel right now. Things are happening faster, change is happening faster. In the context of things like pandemics, you anticipate that people can, uh, we actually spent most of our time talking about the ability for someone to create something like COVID, putting aside conspiracy theories aside, um, the advent and decrease in costs exponentially of tools that allow people to manipulate and manage DNA and the spread of knowledge allowing many more people around the world to build these things. And so that's where the course starts, this idea of we need to, as lawyers, or you know as lawyers, uh, people who are interested in policy, really grapple with the idea that the systems that we have set up to manage and govern our life, to create laws, to adjudicate laws, to manage justice, we're designed in a linear world. And we are living through now an exponential world. And there couldn't be more of an object lesson than what just occurred with COVID. And if you think about the disputes at the beginning of this, when people just really couldn't understand, well, it's just like the flu. And, you know, hey, there's only, a, there's only 50 people who have this thing what they were paying attention to was linear thinking, not the thinking of people who spend a lot of time understanding that doubling or growing at an exponential rate has extreme implications in a relatively short period of time. So I'll pause there and I'll sort of pause back to you, Ben. And, and I think maybe it would be helpful for the group to um, dig not into your academic life, but into your Blue Jay life. Mm -hmm. Because uh, about two years into this course, Ben said, you know, I, I'm not just going to do law. I'm going to build an artificial intelligence company. Um, and it's going to do something very particular. Um, and I do remember that you hosted a seminar, I think maybe um, with a few other uh, professors for the faculty, of, uh, faculty of law. And you described the future that you envisioned for the company that you're building. And what was interesting to me was how the faculty at our faculty, a significant number of them just couldn't get their heads around what you were saying. It was, it was inconceivable, right? Um, and so take us from where you started, what was your idea and to where you are today? And the thing I think I'd love you to focus on because it's to the question of how do we think about law this day? What were the reactions and how do you think people are gonna react in the future as you describe what you're about to get to? Right, uh, okay, so Blue Jay Legal is a, is a company that exists in order to uh, make the law uh, accessible, clear, uh, predictable, uh, on demand, everywhere and on demand. So the vision is of, of really what I would term uh, complete law. And it's true that artificial intelligence, machine learning plays a huge role in this. The idea is, um, can we use you know, different forms of legal information to make the law uh, predictable? And the, the, the way that's manifesting at the moment is, uh, for a whole bunch of different topics in tax law, in employment law, um, in Canada, also in the United States, uh, you can use uh, Blue Jay legal software to get a prediction, a, a really accurate prediction, a more than 90% um, accurate prediction of what a court would do with respect to a, a really rich description of facts and circumstances in a particular case um, based on all the prior case law on that particular question. And so um, what, what's the, the power of this? Well, it, it really goes back um, at least to Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. in 1897 in The Path of the Law. Holmes has this famous um, paper in the Harvard Law Review, um, and the, the, the most cited 
sentence from this article uh, is, goes something like this. For the rational study of law, the black letter man may be the man of the present, but the man of the future is the man of statistics and the master of economics. Uh, and Holmes is ma basically making the claim that he's not sure how it's going to happen, but sometime in the future, um, math is going to solve law or be a big piece of understanding and predicting law. And fundamentally, Holmes's position was a positivist one. You know, law is all about understanding law is all about predicting legal outcomes. And so, um, you know, this, this gave rise to uh, volumes and volumes of law reviews debating this and lots of ink has been spilled about um, thinking about law as a prediction problem. But we really at Blue Jay um, take on this view that law is a prediction problem fundamentally and we can help solve this prediction problem using machine learning and artificial intelligence. So um, I, I remember well the, the talk that I gave that you referenced at the faculty. It was in one of our, our Monday lunches uh, and, and you dropped in and, and sat at the back and kind of witnessed uh, this talk. I talked about uh, this idea of the legal singularity and how I think the law is, is kind of on this path towards becoming more complete. Um, and it has roots in, in Holmes's view. It has roots in uh, the writing of John Rawls and the theory of justice from 1971 and this idea of a reflective equilibrium. So there are good, you know, historical um, antecedents to this view that that law can be um, predicted and, and we're going to end up in, in more or less a complete legal system. But it's super clear that uh, there's a lot of resistance to this idea and lots of um, Lots of folks who are prepared to point out uh, the different challenges that that this kind of approach to the legal system is going to encounter, no question. But it's it's actually it's happening uh, now, and so um, this software is is in use by um, numerous law firms, um, numerous accounting firms, uh, by the federal government, the Department of Justice, um, the Canada Revenue Agency. We're in talks with uh, the IRS in the U.S. Um, you know, so this is this is happening. Uh, in real time. And, and as computing power becomes exponentially more powerful, and as uh, we become better at, at the algorithms uh, and understanding how to harness that computing power to gain insight into what the law requires, um, these tools are only going to get better uh, going forward. So, so let's just pause because I think there's a, yeah. you, a whole bunch of great questions pop <laughs> about, um, about Blue Jay Legal. Could it be applicable to criminal law? And actually, I think that's was the subject of that talk. You're saying like, this is where it's going to go. And I think the short answer, Paul, is yes, it could be applicable to criminal law. Uh, so now you ask the question, what are the implications? Could this be problematic? And the answer is potentially it could be. There's there, Or it could be great. There's all sorts of implications. Um, and then the question about where does the learning data come from? All of these are great questions. And I'm just going to maybe hold back on going deep into them because I, I, I don't want to, we don't want to do a Blue Jay legal seminar. Yeah. The main point of and to get to the topic of uh, at hand which is like what is COVID-19 talk about law and tech is that many people when they hear about this idea um, have resistance to it they don't want to accept that the change is coming that quickly or that it will happen and so I thought these are some good questions because no one said this is not possible which which is often a, a pretty common answer, right? You know, you would meet a lawyer and they will say, it is not possible. That is not what the mind of a judge does. That's not what the mind of a lawyer does. And yet you've now shown that you can get extremely good accuracy of what judges would otherwise predict. And so I think to go back to this theme one is that I would say that COVID is teaching us more generally that we have to take seriously that change will come and it can come relatively quickly. And just like that exponential curve where it doesn't seem like anything is happening, you know, it's just a small number of people, go play golf, go hang out, everything's fine. And then all of a sudden it's 20,000 people a day. That is the power of an exponent. And it sounds strange, but our belief is that there's a similar mechanism underlying the growth of things like AI as applied to the law. Seems very slow and doesn't seem like it's gonna happen, but there will come a moment, which we can't always predict, where it will rapidly accelerate. And then the questions are, what do we do about that world? How can we react? And, and we'll talk about it more um, in a second. Well, Ben, why don't you talk about it? Like, what, what does the legal profession do, given that we know that change is going to come? And by the way, we talk in the class, we talk about uh, nanomaterials. We talk about things happening at a very small scale. We talk about quantum computing, another technology that is nascent. Um, but 
but could dramatically change the way that we protect all of our information because it would impact and essentially obviate all the cryptography in the world. Um, there's a question coming up about privacy. We see that question and it's a good one. We should talk about it in terms of it. Um, but just think about the implication for privacy of one day, every single encryption in the world could be undone, right? That's a really powerful question about um, something like quantum computing. So we cover all these technologies, but there's this common thread. Maybe you could talk a little bit about like some of the observations you've had that have come out of the class about like, how do we react? What should we change? How do we change mindsets, institutions to react to the world that we live in? Yeah, I think it's I think it's a really it's a really interesting question, and it relates to some of the the academic work too that's going on at the faculty. Michael Trevilko a, a few years ago wrote this book, Dealing with Losers: How Do We Deal with with Legal Change and, and where you have policy change and, and changing uh, regimes. Uh, how do you actually how do you cope with that? How do you deal with the the realistic political economy problems associated with changing? Um, you know, regulatory approaches. So a nice example, and I, and this is, this is coming out of the course and the conversations that we're having in the course, um, relate to something that's, that's really local to us in Toronto. I remember, uh, we were, we were meeting to have a chat about, uh, the course, Daniel, and, uh, my office faced, uh, Queens Park and there was a demonstration happening. Uh, there were taxi cabs literally parked like bumper to bumper all the way around um, Queens Park and all of these taxi drivers were, were honking um, and they were protesting uh, the, the entry of ride sharing companies into uh, the Toronto market and they're saying we're you know we're complying their claim was we're complying with the, the municipal regulations such as they are uh, and um, these other these other entrants into the market are, are just flouting the law they're, they're not subjecting themselves to the law uh, and we're at a disadvantage for being um, law-abiding uh, taxi cab drivers, limo drivers. Um, this is grossly unfair, and it raises these big questions like, what do we do in these circumstances? Um, and, and I see in the Q&A, people are asking um, questions that, that are themed along these lines. Is the law just hopelessly ill-equipped to deal with these kinds of changes, right? Uh, you know, technological changes, putting pressure on existing legal institutions, how should we do it? I, I mean, one answer is, well, you know, the, the existing regime at that time was itself a product of uh, folks offering ride sharing uh, and taxi services in an unlicensed way prior to those licenses um, being introduced earlier in the 20th century. So that whole municipal licensing regime for um, taxis was a product of earlier pressure where the, the law kind of responded and, and kind of reached uh, a relatively stable equilibrium until a new technological change, you know, prompted uh, significant resistance. And then obviously things happened uh, at the city and the city responded and, and uh, we, we are now at a, a, a new relatively stable equilibrium. Um, I think this, this is a recurring theme over time. And I think one of the, the big things is that this is just going to keep happening, but more and more frequently. And so there must be lessons we can we can extract from these experiences uh, and learn to generalize you know the best approach we should be we should be in in search for a playbook about how to you know search for the new likely areas that are going to be creating friction for us like what's that playbook look like and then in the event that we see a flare up that there that there are these problems how do we deal with it I think Trebilko in his book dealing with losers is a good job of of some of those approaches and the things that you have to think about. Um, I think technological changes uh, are come in a wide variety of forms, which is why a course like ours, where we're, we're kind of canvassing a bunch of different potential areas and, and trying to stay up on the research by having grad students from those different areas in the class uh, is, is really, really valuable. Um, Let, let's, just, let's just pause on that one point, because I think you pulled out two that I think are themes like we promised we would give you uh, questions to think about not answers. So let's talk about questions that you can ask yourself in your practice in the way that your colleagues whatever particular community association or legal association or community that you're part of how, how much you're thinking like this. So two themes that you brought out. One is interdisciplinary. Uh, interdisciplinary. So the class that I took at Stanford and the class that we have run for six years, we have always insisted, it was a condition of the course, that at least a third or half the class not be lawyers. And we did that not because we don't like lawyers, 
but because you know, having us all in the room talking to each ourselves does not actually help us adapt to a world that is changing and is interconnected, especially in these highly technical areas, right? It can seem like a fool's errand to have a bunch of non-technical people dream about the future that could happen. I mean, you know, and by the way, there's nothing bad about that. You can get some great science fiction that brings up some extremely good issues. But what you find often in the best science fiction as they think about alternate futures, which is really what they're doing, is a lot of them actually base their thinking on current science and extrapolate forward. Um, sometimes they invent their own things. Famously, Arthur C. Clarke basically invented the idea for the communication satellite. Okay, so bringing in people to your life, to your uh, world of thinking, to your community, to your group, whatever it is, um, thinking about how people outside that space with a technical bent could bring their perspective. And so in our class, we've had engineers, epidemiologists, chemists, uh, physicists, computer scientists, and they have dramatically changed the perspectives of people. And they do two things. One is they help you get a sense of what's real and not. They explain uh, in layman's terms, hopefully, uh, what's a very complicated topic, and most of these are. And two, uh, they help us gauge probability, because a lot of this is about a probabilistic world. This could happen, this small event could happen, but it would have big implications. And they also help you move away from the science fiction. Right? It's very easy to get terrified by like, you know, generally intelligent computers that are going to take all our jobs and all that stuff. But when you talk to people about how it's done, it, you find out it, it's going to be a while. And that, 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 so I think lesson one, work with people. Lawyers are going to have to work with people that have technical skills uh, in, a, in a way that has never happened before. And it's funny, I go back to that Oliver Wendell Holmes quote. You can read it on one hand as being specifically about the thing he's talking about, statistics and math. But you can also read it more generally as about the, the lawyer of the future is one who understands technology and empirical methods and brings to bear a broad range of techniques. And I, I like to think about that broader view because I think it answers the question. Um, you, there was a second, a second point you said about um, but essentially gaming and thinking about the future more proactively. And I think that's another big theme that we have got in our course, which is that we cannot, I mean, if, if you think about the common law, right? What does the common law do? It waits, it waits until something happens and parties have a dispute and then we say, come to us and we'll sort this out and then that becomes the new rule. It does not wait for problems to happen or look for problems that are about to happen and say, here's the new rule. That's the job of you know, politicians. That's the job of policy and legal. Um, and of course, in the class, we talk about both. They are obviously interdependent. But I think uh, my view would be that COVID is teaching us that we have to be much more proactive, uh, at least in learning about these potential futures. And certainly, I would say, in preparing, uh, thinking about how we could, and hopefully, in actually taking steps. Someone said something about Facebook. We've had it for 15 years. We don't have camera phones are everywhere. We're just thinking about intrusion against exclusion, just thinking about invasion of privacy. So... So the questions that were asked are, should we just leave it to, sell, to the market? Should we just let the law, how can the law keep up? Well, part of the answer is that, that the law has to change its mindset, that its role is not simply to react, but it actually has a role in uh, prescri prescription and, and also a role in not reacting in a panic or reacting in first instance, this is the first time this has occurred, but actually thinking about it before it happens. Because in an exponential curve, you don't have a lot of time. And this is exactly what we've, we're living through right now. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier the sort of um, artificial general intelligence uh, scenario, which I think is, some, is far off, but is not impossible. If that occurs, and what I'm really referring to is a, a basically a, a computer becoming sentient and then gaining control using the powers of what a computer would have, um, that, that would take not a lot of time. We would not have a lot of time to start thinking things through. So the time to think about it is now. Right. You mentioned um, and I'll give you another example from our class. It's perhaps a little bit simpler, but you mentioned when we started talking about Uber. Right. In our class, we talked about it. Uber was coming. We had a whole we had a section on transportation. And then uh, a couple of years later, I remember I was in Santa Monica and we saw scooters. Um, and the one thing that Ben and I did is we called the people who from the city helped helped us you know, teach the class about regulating Uber and said, heads up, this is about to happen. And um, the irony of ironies is one of, one of, one of our, uh, a lawyer friend of mine um, tweeted at me, you know, nah, it's never going to happen. Scooters aren't going to come to Toronto. We're in the winter. This can't happen. 
And the irony of ironies is that that guy is now running bird in Canada. <laughs> he's come around and he is running a scooter business. And, and so that's a really good example of like, no way, never going to happen here. And then very quickly, all of a sudden scooter starts showing up. And I would argue that part of the reason why we've had a different rollout to this question of, can we keep up is because we lived through that before. So um, if you'll forgive me, I'm going to have the third element that I think is really important. Sure. Resilience. Our systems are brittle, very brittle. They don't handle change, rapid change. Um, there's a great book called Anti-Fragile um, that I encourage people to read. And uh, it's by the same fellow who coined the term the black swan. And, and, and what he described is that many of our systems we have today are rigid. They don't cha handle change well. And, you know, if you think about our legal system today, I mean, our access to justice is shut down right now. Right? We have, it, it, you know, people aren't filing claims. The courts are closed. We, we have demonstrated clearly that we are not able to handle this type of racket change. We have to build systems that can react to change and even when we don't know where it's coming from. So resiliency, interdisciplinary, and proactive. Those are three themes, I think, that we've taken from the class. There's a whole bunch more questions, so maybe yeah. we want to jump into some of those. Yeah, I, I, think, I think I want to tackle, uh, and, and this, is a, this is obviously um, a challenge because there are so many questions. I think we have 20 open questions now uh, in the Q&A. But uh, one, one thing that I'd just like to say uh, about the role, because I think a lot of the questions, understandably, are about legal technology using artificial intelligence or machine learning to, to make legal uh, predictions. Um, some of the concerns are around, you know, biased predictions coming out of AI or machine learning where the, the training data are past judgments of the courts and, and are we worried about entrenching historical uh, approaches to, to really challenging questions that don't have um, a pat answer or may have an evolving answer based on um, changes uh, to to society and, and social uh, preferences and understandings about, you know, the, the incomplete nature of, of the thought that went into prior uh, judgments. I think what I would say is actually there's, there's a very, very interesting um, element of just kind of fostering awareness about the patterns of past decision making that is very helpful for deciding the next case. Uh, and so I'll put it this way. Um, if you if you train an algorithm on the past 20 years of cases on a particular legal issue, um, you can build a pretty good model of how cases have been decided um, for the past 20 years and a pretty good, you, and you can build in a time trend so that you can make predictions about what the courts would do tomorrow in a, in a, in a particular rich set of facts. Um, that's not the end of the story. All that's saying is the best prediction of what would happen tomorrow based on what's happened recently uh, in the courts is X with a certain percentage of probability. Um, so the probability of, of finding in favor of the plaintiff here is 90%. Um, and, I, and I think it's, it's really interesting to think about systematically, what does that actually mean? Well, I think if you get a very strong prediction, it means that, that that's you know, obviously a, a pretty strong prediction, but you can think about using this sort of technology to discriminate between things that are very, very likely to happen and things that are, are much more debatable. So if you just think about it as um, identifying no brainer cases and separating them from highly debatable cases, um, think about what that does to the evolution of law with respect to that legal issue um, going forward. Well, predictably, um, those cases that, that seem extremely likely to go one way or the other if they're taken to court are going to disproportionately settle. If it becomes common knowledge that this is a no-brainer kind of case for the plaintiff or for the defendant, um, that's, those cases are gonna settle even more than they do now. And what it means is that the role of judges becomes even more important because they're gonna be faced with a docket full of more challenging cases, all else the same than they would have uh, in the past. So one of the paradoxes here is that as this technology becomes better and better at predicting uh, and discriminating between those cases that have clear um, outcomes and, and those that are more debatable. So it puts more pressure on judges to, to exercise their normative function, their, their discriminating function in figuring out who should prevail in those more debatable cases. But of course, that's how the system is supposed to work anyway. Uh, and we're, that's how we kind of zoom in on the law and eliminate these um, gray areas. We kind of run these contests between competing principles all the time. It's so much of what we do at the law school is look at appellate cases where there are really compelling 
um, contest between um, clear principles that have merit and try to you know think through how do we, how do you resolve these really difficult um, problems where competing principles uh, are in play. So what I see the role of machine learning um, and legal tech in this context as helping to speed up the evolution of the law, far from kind of ossifying the law and kind of baking in and entrenching a particular point of view in the law, it opens up the possibility of, of evolution of the law uh, going forward. And so things like strategic litigation are much more likely. And if I were at an NGO and I, I were trying to push a, a certain um, evolutionary path for the law on a particular issue, I'd be hunting for those cases that look like they've got a 40% chance, 45% chance of winning um, and then I chip away at those cases and nudge the law um, in the direction that, that I'd like to the, see the law move in for independent policy reasons and try to justify um, that. So uh, that's, that's kind of, that's one implication of this. It's, it's to kind of hold up a mirror to the way that the law has been operating to allow more informed um, decision making by um, you know, everyone in society about is this is this the legal system that we would want? Are these the the patterns of decisions that we'd want to see? Uh, and it can help the law to to evolve more quickly um, and efficiently um, from where it is uh, to uh, to a new equilibrium. So, uh, I I think yes, all those comments and and those questions raise legitimate concerns around bias and. Um, entrenching historical issues, but the best way to, to address them is to be cognizant of them and to, to really expose them uh, to light and see uh, what, what's the best way to move forward, because that's, that's what we control, right? We, just, we control what we do from this point forward. So um, I think, by the way, there was a question if we could open the questions up. There's a ton of them now, which is great. It's, it's lovely to see people are so engaged on this topic, um, and I think we're going to try and do that. Um, you know, clearly in the next 22 minutes, we will not be able to cover the implications on patent and copyright law, criminal law, um, privacy, um, you know, bias in AI. This seminar is meant to be a sampler. I wanted to maybe bring up a fourth element of themes of like, how does law have to change in this post-COVID world in, in, in what we think about is sort of a post-exponential world. Like everyone now gets it. We live in a world that has accelerating exponentials, right? And so that has implications for how fast we have to move and how fast we have to change or how we have to be more resilient. Um, we hinted at, you know, being inter interdisciplinary, having more proactivity thinking. Um, so the one other one we didn't touch on, and I do want to hit the question was legal education. Right? Like the reason we teach this class is because we think these issues are important. And I feel proud to know that of the, well, I think we have about 40 people a year take it, you know, we've got a, 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 a probably five, six, a couple hundred, you know, young lawyers and scientists out there who have spent time thinking about this um, in a structured way. And, you know, if we could, we'd figure out how to teach more people in this class. There's always a long wait list for the class, which is nice to hear. Um, and what we, often here, of course, look, it's, it's, it's a seminar class and it's a little different from other stuff. So, so I think we're, we're, we're um, you know, it's not a fair fight. Um, but, but I think what people, students love about it is exactly the types of questions that people are asking here. And I think I would turn back to the audience and say, look, we can't answer all these things, but it is up to the legal profession to recognize that it has to start thinking about these things more generally. And I think someone pointed out, like, these aren't new questions. It's true. There's definitely a subset of lawyers and, and the law who think about it. But let's be candid, the law is not known of as like a trend setting early adopter type of industry, right? Um, and that's probably not a good thing uh, if we live in the world that we live in today. In a world that's pretty stable, you know, want much more stability in the way that the profession thinks. In a world that is much more spiky and open, we probably want the legal profession to be ready and practitioners to be ready for rapid change. So someone asked the question about, you know, remote work. Uh, and law firms, are they ready? Um, I, th I think we're, we're experiencing a moment where we're going to find out those who were ready will thrive and survive. Those who had moved to, uh, you know, digital case management, uh, full disclosure, I'm an investor in a company uh, called Clio that does this. Um, but, but, but those who resisted and said, no, we're not moving our systems over. We're not going to invest in being future proof, I think are going to have challenges in the coming years and months. Um, and it's, uh, it's not, it's not going to be pleasant. But I think those who make investments in being resilient will survive and thrive. 
right? Um, um, and even the stuff that, you know, Ben and I talked about it, we, we talked to our students and when they get a little bit anxious when they hear about Ben's technology, they're like, what's that gonna mean for me? And we remind them that, you know, the vast majority of what it used to mean to be an articling student 30, 40 years ago was to go down and look up cases. No one does that now. You used Nexus Lexus or, or Westlaw for that. Um, so I, I feel like, um, I feel like, you know, we, we really should be thinking about um, making our legal profession more able and capable of handling shocks. Um, and one of those things is investing in technology like remote work, like the cloud. Um, and, and I think the other one is investing in ridding ourselves of the answer no. Now, no is powerful. It slows things down. It allows for sober second thought. But no is also a blocker of resiliency. And honestly, how many law firms, how many legal uh, thinkers have simply refused to engage in the future that's coming? And that's not helpful anymore. And I think it's a wake up call. So back to my main point, we need our students to think about these things as they go forward. Um, so there's some awesome questions that are coming through here. I don't know if you've had a chance to browse any and want to jump into some. Yeah, I mean, I, I think some people are asking questions about, uh, you know, how how is remote teaching worked at the, the law school? But, I mean, the truth is, it happened very, very quickly. I think there was a decision made on a Friday to offer classes all online beginning Monday morning. Our class was Monday morning at 830. So I remember scrambling with you on the weekend uh, saying, okay, I guess we're, we're doing class virtually on Monday. And, and the, the faculty's IT support was phenomenal. And they, they scrambled, put everything into place. And we, we delivered our class Monday morning at 830. Um, we're, we're on time and on schedule. We, I think we had a guest lecturer that day. We got the guest lecturer um, there in the class and on time and, and all the students were able to access it. Uh, and I think the course evaluations reflect, and so the last several weeks of classes were all online um, in our seminar, in my tax class. Uh, and I, I think students responded reasonably well. I think it was much better than I would have expected the experience to be. And I think our experience in the classroom at the law school uh, has been replicated by a whole bunch of folks throughout the, the legal profession, actually. I think uh, a lot of law firms were unsure about moving to remote work and, and have kind of been compelled to do that. I think the courts are also moving to having more online hearings. And I think there's an openness uh, to doing that. So it's actually, it's really phenomenal uh, to see. And sometimes, you know, it, it, uh, necessity is the mother of invention. And it's not that we're inventing these new uh, methods for doing remote work, but it's it's new for the folks who are now encountering Zoom for the first time and, right. and doing this for but, the first time. But Ben, I think the, the point I'm trying to make is we have to get to a place, and I'm not suggesting like widespread, everybody has to adopt every new cool gadget and new cool thing, and we should all be like that. It's not a good society. I wouldn't want to live in it. But we have to get to a place where change that is positive is not, it doesn't require a global pandemic for us to change. Mm -hmm. Right. Like we're we're think about how many conversations are saying, you know, we could do class online. We could do courts online. We could do filings digitally. We could do all these things. And there is a uh, entrenched mindset of no, we can't. Here's why we can't. And then, of course, COVID breaks out and we do. We figure out that we can do these things. That's probably my own my own bias as a you know early adopter tech kind of person. But I do think it's probably worth noting that 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 mindset is not helpful. It makes the system more fragile because you're operating on technology and mindsets that are old and that it requires like a crisis in order to get change as opposed to a mindset that we can always improve the effectiveness of the delivery of these things. And we should be very open to the delivery of these things. I'm, you know, I'm gonna, I, want, I, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't touch on um, mindset. Uh, and I noticed that there's a bunch of questions about privacy. Great. Right. Obviously, in a world where you have Apple and Google sharing location data, contact tracing, um, you know, other jurisdictions around the world. I, I, in fact, I remember on that very first conversation immediately our class went. they rebelled. They got very upset when we started to our, you know, list off like this is what's happening in, in Korea and in Singapore. You know, if you get the, the disease your name is posted publicly. We know where you went because it's a collective responsibility or, you know, we're going to have contact tracing on your phone. And the students immediately were like, can't do it, privacy, not the right thing, can't, can't have, a, have a problem with it. And, and my, my point that I wanna get to here is less about um, addressing the privacy questions, because that 
I'm not an expert in it. And of course there are implications. And of course we have to find balance. My point is that nobody here, not one of the lawyers here has uh, asked a questions about um, forcible confinement rights. And I think it's because us lawyers, you know, lawyers think about privacy. That's a thing. Privacy is a mindset. Oh, what, what are the rights of privacy? What do we do? And as this debate is sort of forming and we're thinking about reactions, there's a lot of people who are articulating what are the privacy implications of doing these things. True. Um, but it seems to me, and that's because we've had 20 years of courses and, and case law and privacy, chief privacy officers and all these things. There's a whole mindset. There's a, a environment of thinking about this. We've never had uh, the corresponding rights um, talk or rights institutions or uh, advocacy groups or a chief, you know, um, mobility officer for the province, right? That like ensures people can move around. We've never thought about that before. Um, and so I actually wonder, like, it, it is interesting and we've joked about it that like, you know, forcing people to stay at home is a significant human right violation. Like it, it, in other contexts, we call it, you know, we call it home confinement. I have a legitimate point that there are actual rights that are being infringed dramatically right now. Um, but I don't think we see it that way. Anyways, that's an observation about what these changes bring. And maybe my response to a lot of the privacy questions were, I don't have the answer, but I asked the question in response, which is where are the questions being asked about the other rights that we're violating right now in order to, to rightly and justly protect everyone? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have a thought on that. Um, <laughs> I, I, or maybe we should I, just keep I'm going lean the on, I'm gonna lean on the, the thing that we said at the beginning, which is we can ask a lot of questions and uh, we, right. don't, we don't have all the answers. Uh, one, one thing that, that I wanted to probe a little bit uh, on is this idea that um, long live things usually, so you know, this is, I'm gonna raise an argument in defense of the status quo, which is if something's been happening for a pretty long time, usually there are some hidden reasons why a particular institutional arrangement has survived that long, right? So I think I think this this point kind of comes from uh, the anti-fragile anti book by Taleb that you mentioned earlier. Actually, you know, the longer something has been around, probably uh, the the stronger are kind of the hidden reasons why it it's surviving and making sense. So this is kind of a pushback against like let's chase all the shiny new things as they come along. Instead, you know, this is kind of supporting this idea that, well, if, if an institutional arrangement has been very long lived, it must be really quite functional and it must be robust. Otherwise, it would have been superseded by now. Uh, and so I'm just, I'm, I'm putting on the hat of like the counter argument. If I wanted to defend the status quo, what would I say? I'd say, well, if an institution has been around for 100 years, there's probably some, some deep uh, reason why it's been successful for 100 years. And the best prediction of how long something is going to you know, persist is probably for about as long as it's already been in existence. So if something is two weeks old, the best prediction is that, well, it might last another two weeks in the absence of any other information, right? If you're just observing, the only thing you're observing about some phenomenon is that it existed for a set period of time, you should just assume that you're observing it at the midpoint of its life, right? Um, because you don't know anything else about this. So um, it's just, it's, it's, it's a bit of a, and I, I'm not usually in the position of defending the status quo or suggesting that things should stay the same. So this is uh, an unusual position for me to be advocating or at least taking for the sake of argument. But how do you respond to, to those kinds of questions? Uh, well, I, I think the response I have is that I don't think people appreciate how, how different the world we live in today is from the world we lived in 50 years ago. Of course, there are commonalities and maybe that's my bias. I look for things that are different. Um, but I want to go back to where we started this conversation, which is sort of the themes of our class, this idea of accelerating and self-reinforcing exponentials. Um, the, my reaction to that is that might be true in the old world. That might be true in the assumptions that we used to have, that the half-life of an institution in a linear world where things just get incrementally better or incrementally worse or incrementally change, that's fine. You're right, the half-life is a half day. But in a world where you can go from no people have a disease to 20 million people have a disease in three months. That's, that's, that's not a good accurate uh, rule of thumb. That rule of thumb of like the half-life of existence of an institution or the utility of an institution is no longer accurate. And so I'd go back and say, you know, it's not just that computers keep getting faster and cheaper every 18 months, which is Moore's law, or it's also the fact that we have 7 billion people on the planet. You know, we had three and a half, you know, when I was a kid. That, that's a lot more billions of people, right? It's just an enormously, and more importantly, 
you know, uh, I think uh, some of the conversation here is about like the biases inherent in um, case law driving towards what you've done and how that's going to reinforce it. I, I argue, and I mean, I think I'm probably making the same point. You think about it, you know, most of the world, most of the technology, most of the wealth was created by a small population of maybe 50 to 100 million people who were connected over the last 100 years. They had rail travel, they had access to telegram, maybe then telephone. We have rocketed into a world where, you know, kids with a smartphone, uh, you know, this phone I have is, 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 is literally a million times more powerful than all the computers that sent men to the moon. And, you know, this is an old phone. And it's not just a phone, it's a phone, it's a supercomputer is what it really is. We just call it a phone. So now there are billions of supercomputers in billions of people's hands and they're not independent. They're connected to the cloud. They have access to billions of, 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 um, of dollars worth of computing power and storage power and machine learning algorithms. And the reason I'm listing all these things off, or we talk about biotechnology to bring it back to this, you know what's scarier than COVID, which probably was a, a naturally occurring thing. What's scarier than COVID is some small group of people or an individual who has access to a gene sequencer and the CRISPR uh, enzyme cutting, taking COVID and genetically modifying that on their own and releasing it into the world. That is the world that we live in. So to go back to your question about like, why, why is it you know, different? I think it's because we live in a world where ideas spread extremely quickly and the tools to do something with those ideas are now in everyone's hands and that has to mean that we can't rely on a rule of thumb of like hey everything's okay today so therefore it'll be okay tomorrow and we should change how we think about law um privacy copyright law to account for that world Ben, i think we've probably got to wrap up here um and I still yeah. don't think we're getting questions, which is great. Hey. I, you know what? It does remind me, we probably should open our class up uh, for people and do some live seminars once we can get back together at some point. I had, I'm, I'm a bit overwhelmed here. Yeah, I'm just looking at, let's, let's just, I, I will quickly address um, one final question, which I think is a nice kind of bookend to this whole conversation. So this is, this is a question asking about, based on our experience, what should technical folks, so scientists, engineers, focus on with respect to making our legal systems more resilient uh, or to make more responsible technology? How can they better interact with lawyers and policymakers? So my answer to that, and, and uh, I'll give you a second to think about it. Um, my answer to that is, you know, a lot of the responsibility um, falls to the lawyers and the policymakers to be interacting with scientists and engineers more effectively and, and asking the right questions. Um, so there, there's a role for a course like the one that um, Daniel and I are teaching uh, at the law school to to help facilitate that that interaction that communication. So I think I think the onus is kind of on on the legal profession, on policymakers, on regulators to better interact with science, scientists and engineers and and try to better understand um, the technology. I think there is uh, also a role, obviously, for those scientists and engineers to um, be open to those conversations and having those conversations with with lawyers and policymakers. Um, but it, it's hard for me to come up with a magical solution aside from communicating uh, better and more effectively across these, these uh, disciplinary divides about what we should be doing. I think it, it requires conversation. And I'd say for those of you who are here and find this stimulating, there are lots and lots of resources available online. I mean, I think, Ben, we can happily share our syllabus and the books that we use. Um, but there's great resources like Singularity University, which is like an entire virtual university essentially dedicated to this concept of accelerating exponentials is out there. Um, and all of you can take an opportunity to kind of, kind of learn more, dig more, dig deeper, and think about what are the implications of these accelerating technologies um, to sort of future-proof ourselves and think about what does law and technology look like in the context of, hey, um, we live in a world that is, I, we'll call it, it's not post-COVID, it's post-exponential. I think that's my, my hope that we look, we realize we live in that world today. Um, you know, I think last thing I'd say is if people want to engage personally, I'm on Twitter, uh, D Debo, D D E B O W. And, uh, you can always message me. I'm also D Debo at gmail.com. Uh, no problem. If people want to have an individual conversation, um, and uh, our hope today, like we said, was to leave you with more questions and answers. And I hope we hope we hope we've done that. Yeah, I echo, I echo, um, I echo all of your sentiments, Dan. I'm at uh, 
B. Allery uh, on Twitter, uh, message me. Uh, you can find me that way. Happy to carry on this conversation. It seems like a lot of the, the questions in the Q&A relate to legal technology and what it means for, for the legal profession, no surprise there. I think that's what we would have uh, expected. Um, maybe just thank everybody uh, for coming. Thanks to the, the law school for, for hosting this uh, and turn it over to um, the, the conveners for final words. So it's just Raquel Preston here from the Faculty of Law Advancement Office. And on behalf of the advancement team, thank you so much, Ben and Dan, for this interesting presentation. Um, and thank you to all the alumni and friends of the law school that participated in the webinar today. Um, in the next